Hey there, camels. Today, I want to continue our little series on locals. Um, um, so the previous two videos, uh, we looked at local parameters. And then last time we looked at local um, uh, sort of local local variables um, and return values. Uh, today, I want to take a step back from trying to write functions and start looking a little bit more at the theory behind all of this so that we can sort of understand how to sort of think about locals and globals and sort of how they all interact. And uh, the, the start of this theory is that these things are called modes. So I can start writing that out here. So local and whoops and global are modes. But that doesn't necessarily mean very much to you. What's a mode? Um, a mode is kind of like a type. Um, and I, I want to, there's a lot of reasons I'm sort of saying kind of like a type. There's various differences. Um, but a type describes an expression. Every expression in OCaml has some type, right? Five has type int and some big expression might have, might be a, a string list option or something like that. There's all of these different types that flow around. Every expression has a type. That also means that every variable must have a type because a variable in some sense stands for an expression. Um, I say in some sense because we actually always have to evaluate that expression into a value before storing it into a variable. Um, but we, we have these types to make sure that we don't have errors, right? Modes are similar in that every expression has a certain mode, and that means that we have to assign every variable a mode as well. So let's now start looking at, at a little bit of code. Um, so if, let's say, let's build my little structure here that I like to work in. Okay, let's just make sure, is that working? That's working, great. Um, and here, if I say let local x equals hello, um, then this x here is going to be in the local mode as well as this hello expression is going to be in the local mode. Um, and, and this compiles just fine. Oh, we're going to get some unused variable expressions. Let's kill that off with a warning thing. Okay, good. Um, so we, last time I used ignore, now we're just going to use this, this, the warning setting. Um, so here we have a local x, and this local annotation is forcing x to be in the local mode. And then we can say it's, it's some value. Um, if I have y here, well, it's kind of annoying. I can't actually put a little annotation on y to say what mode, if I want y to be global, because we don't have a global annotation. And I'll explain why in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but instead, what I can do is I can say um, mark global, which will be some function, um, which just ignores its argument. But the key thing here is that I've labeled this as it takes any alpha, but I haven't said that it's a local alpha. And so again, I can't write global here. There is a global keyword. We'll see it in a few minutes. But, um, but I can't write it on a type. Uh, or on a type argument, on an argument to a function, I should say. Um, uh, and so here, I'm going to have to say something like mark global y. And then now, oh, syntax, or oops, I forgot the let. Okay, there we go. So this y is global, this x is local. Um, and uh, but, but there's not really any obvious way to see that. But if I say let y equals x, that's going to be a problem. This value escapes its region. And that's because this mark global down here says that y has to be global. It's using inference to do that, much the same way that type inference figures out types. Um, and it's saying because x, which is declared as local, flows into y, we know that y also has to be local. right? We saw the last in the, in the last couple of videos that, um, that local values can't, can't escape. And so that means that they also can't flow into global values because then the global values might escape and that would be sort of a sneaky way for a local to escape. So we can't, we just can't have that. That would be very bad. Um, okay, so that's why in here, even though this line isn't anywhere near the end of the region, the end of the region is at the end of the function, but uh, by flowing into y, we know that x might be escaping its region. Um, of course, it turns out that if you look at this program, this program is completely safe with respect to locality. Um, there's nothing bad that's happening, but we don't know that, right? Because the mark global function just says that it takes in an alpha. It doesn't say that it doesn't then store that alpha somewhere. Um, and so because we were looking at the type of mark global and we're trusting it to be true that, 
um, that this is, is rejected. Okay, so we see here how we have a local x and a global y, um, but we can do some other interesting things here. So if we have this, oh, let's make this um, uh, not have an error. So this doesn't have an error anymore. Um, and now what if I do local z equals y? Is that going to be okay? So even though the mark global y is, is all the way down here, this y is still definitely global. It's, it's just like a type in the way that inference works in that you can have something kind of far away that changes its type. Um, for this uh, demonstration, it would be nice to have a global keyword. We don't have that. We don't generally need it. It's really only in, in demonstrations like this that might come in handy. Um, okay, so let's, but let's look at this program. Oops. Um, and oh, let's see. So this works. So that's kind of interesting. So y here I said is global, and yet I'm putting y into a local thing. Now, under t in, in normal type inference, that would be strange. Here, I'm even going to mark this as global here, just like this, so we don't forget. Um, and the reason that this works is that I said local and global are modes, but we have a sub-moding relationship. Global is a sub-mode of local. And that's what I'm using this little less than sign to mean, is that it's, it's um, so if you're familiar with subtyping, right, if you have a subtype and you, you, you try to assign that into a supertype, that works just fine. Modes are the same way. So another way of writing this out is a global expression can always be used in a local context. So let's think about what that means, right? Local says this thing does not escape. Um, a global thing might escape, but but by putting it into a local thing, we're, we're saying here that this copy of it, at least, does not. That's fine. Nothing is escaping by doing that. We can always treat anything as local. Um, and, and, and so we can go in this direction. But we saw earlier that when I tried to assign y equals x, we couldn't flow the other way. A local thing can't suddenly be treated as a global thing because that might cause an escape. Um, another way of thinking about this is that, is that by saying global, we have, we have some capability. We have the capability of escaping. Well, we can always optionally give up a capability. That's just fine. That's what's happening here, is that in, in a sense, the value that, that, that this y is pointing to is going to move into a place where it loses that capability. And that's always okay. On the other hand, if we allowed a local to go into a global, that's like gaining a capability that you didn't have previously. That would be bad. We can't just invent a new capability out of thin air. Um, and so that's why that this sub-mode uh, relationship works. I always find that a little bit confusing because I think of global things as bigger than local things, and yet I have to write global is less than local, but that's just kind of the way it is. Um, another thing to be thinking about with all of this is how do the modes interact with functions? Um, so we already have seen that we need to mark the uh, uh, argument type of a function as local if we want it to be local. So let's let's just do that for a sec here. So we're going to have mark local. And this is going to be a local alpha to unit, which can have the same definition. Let me make sure I haven't made any mistakes. Okay, no mistakes yet. Um, and now let's just see what happens if I do this here. I can mark x local mark y local and mark z local and that's all fine too so let's think about why that's okay so it makes good sense that for x and z it's okay because they've been declared as local so that's not really a surprise is it is it okay that we can mark local y well it is because of this same submoding relationship y is still global there's no way that the program is really telling you that but it really is i promise you um but because a global thing can be, can, can be sub-moded into a local thing, this is just fine. And, and let's also think about what this local annotation on the parameter really means in the function. It means that this parameter is not escaping. So that's a promise that mark local is making about its implementation. It's not a requirement of anything about its parameter. So what this says is that if I mark a parameter as local, I can still pass any local or global into that parameter. Again, this is a promise about the implementation. Um, it means that I can't store this in a reference. For example, I can't do this. 
I think that will have an error. I hope that will have an error. Yes, this escapes its region. So here it's kind of silly in that I'm ignoring the reference, but the, 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 the escape analysis is not quite that clever. Um, and so here, this local is just a promise on what's going on over here. It makes no claim at all about how it's used. And so in some sense, we might want to label every parameter everywhere that could be local as local. And, and in fact, we're going we're gonna to see this in a future video, but there is some amount of locality inference that happens that essentially does that. Um, so, so again, this is a promise on here. So maybe that's even worth as a little thing writing down because it's a good thing that I always like to keep in mind. Local on a parameter is a promise about the implementation of a function, not a requirement at usage sites. So already now we're starting to realize that this is a little bit different than types, right? When you mark a type in a function, it's both a statement about the implementation and a requirement on use sites. And here that's not really the case because of this submoding relationship. So going back to, let's bring this back to something that works. Yes, good. Um, so going back up here, this mark local function is kind of ridiculous. Right? I'm saying I'm requiring the argument to be local, but every global can become local. So this requirement is boring. Um, and so essentially, I've just implemented ignore. So let's get rid of it. We don't need it. OK. Um, there's one, one, one more detail that I want to talk about around the relationship between modes and function types. And that's that we label either side of the arrow sign as either being local or not. And this essentially defines four different arrow types. So I'm going to explore this by making all four of them. Um, so we're going to have let f1 is, let's see, local. Uh, start out with a simple one. String arrow string. Um, let f2 is string, whoops, is local string to string. Um, let f3 is string to local string. Um, and I guess this, actually, I can do this. That would be fine. And f4 is local string to local string, which I can also do this way. So the one case that was hard was when I have a local thing going to a global thing. Um, OK, so this all works. So these are four different types. And they are, there is no subtyping relationship between them, although there are some conversions that the OCaml compiler can do. We're going to see that a little bit more when we talk about inference in, in another video. But the important thing to note here is that these really are four different types. And in, in some fundamental sense, they're, they're incompatible with each other. So if I have, let's say we have a ref that's a string arrow string ref, I can say ref f1, and that's fine. But if I do any of the others here, that's going to be an error. Um, and in all of these cases, um, uh, we see that, that, that it doesn't work. And that's because this type is different from the types of all of the others. And I could, I could do all the different permutations here. And we would see that, that it only works when we're actually storing the thing that we mean to store. Um, so I, I, I did have to use a ref here just to sort of uh, prevent OCaml from doing any of the conversions that, that it can sometimes want to do. Um, and, and again, we'll see those in a, in, in a future video. But the, again, the key insights from today are we have these things called modes. They're something that describe actually every expression and every variable, much like a type. Um, there's a submoding relationship that means any global thing can always be treated as if it were local, but never the other way around. Um, and we can annotate these modes on, on the arrow. And it's, it's one thing to think about here is that local string isn't really a thing. Instead, this local underscore here that I'm writing over here, it's really something that's talking about the arrow, right? I can't do this. Oh, maybe I can because there's a silly interpretation of it. Let's just see. I don't know. That might even work. 
Um, no, it even just says syntax error. It doesn't know what this means. Local string isn't a thing. This local is really part of the arrow. So we think it's better um, from a language design to put it over here. But if we were doing this sort of from a, a theoretical standpoint, we might have four different infix symbols with different like squiggly arrows or equal signs or something to denote these four different things. That's really what's going on here. It just so happens that the way we write it in concrete syntax is by putting the, lo the word local over here. Um, okay, I think that's enough for today. Um, uh, more to come. Thanks for watching.